Blessed be the name of the Lord, who is worthy to be praised and adored. The scriptures cannot be broken. The scriptures is full of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the testimony that reached its point of culmination when he was raised from the dead. And I want every one of us to open our hearts to express our gratitude to him for the sacrifice of dying in order to make the miracle of the resurrection possible. When Jesus died, when we sinned against God in Adam, the penalty for that sin was death. And the price to pay for the redemption of that sin was also death. Somebody had to die. But God said, I won't allow the human race to perish. I will pay the price of the death for humanity. And that was how Jesus came on the scene. That was how Jesus came on the scene. Because the word of God became flesh. In order for that penalty of death to be paid. If not for that, God would never have been incarnated and became a man. But because he didn't want humanity to perish by paying the penalty of death and die eternally, Jesus came and became flesh. The word became flesh. And that word we be that became flesh is whom we christened Jesus and the spirit that drove him to do what he did is Christ. Those who have deep insights into scriptures will begin to understand the interplay that God is trying to bring our way through these words that I have just brought forth. And so I want us to thank God and bless his name because of what he did. I am eternally grateful. I am eternally grateful if I don't hear a message this morning, I am happy already because I am here because he died and he rose from the dead. I don't know about you, but I am here because he died and he rose from the dead. Lift up your voice and don't be nominal. Begin to give expression to your gratitude. That is what we call thanksgiving. When you vocalize your gratitude, we call it thanksgiving. And you don't enter in stretches by having gratitude in your heart alone. You must vocalize it. You must give expression to it through your lips, through your mouth, through your voice. E kamala dona abalato e marita e teria lato e premiadano se te calacora e kamana se talate e te so talacora e kamahande e te sitale kalita e teria lavado e kamano e galiadera blessed be the name of the Lord. give you thanks and give you praise. Precious Spirit of God, we ask once again for your manifest presence in our midst. It is our prayer that you will meet us at the point of our need in a way that is personal for everyone. You are a God who meets us at the points of our need and we give you glory. 
let the seven spirits of God the seven horns and the seven eyes which Jesus was worthy to carry let it rest upon every one of us here in the name of Jesus let the anointing that is ever so present in this place exactly 25 minutes to the hour of 10 after I stepped into this auditorium I felt the anointing so strong and I begin to ask Lord why this is unusual and I feel it so strong let that anointing speak for you this morning let it answer for you this morning Father, let there be a release of the power of the anointing. Let there be a release of the power of the anointing. You don't know how sweet Christianity is until you have tasted the anointing. When you taste it, you will never, never, never find it a boring exercise anymore. Are you with me? Mommy asked me, is your message ready? I told her, I am the message. You don't understand what I'm saying. That is what Christianity is. They looked at Jesus. I'm sure they asked him, tell us the truth. He told them, I am the truth. He said, show us the way. He said, I am the way. (laughs) Are you with me? Give us life. He says, I am the life. Are you with me? He said, reveal to us the power of the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection. Give us an example of what it means to be a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Are you with me? Give us bread to eat. I am the true bread which came down from heaven. That is what the resurrection has made possible for you and I. That is what makes Christianity an exciting adventure. When you become the embodiment of everything, Jesus paid the price so that you can benefit and have access to it is a time to live as a son not as a slave not as a captive of the mighty but as a son of the kingdom and that is why the seals in convention world changers convention 2024 seals that will bring you into your manifestation as a sons will be broken so that uh, lives can be liberated in the name of Jesus. I am so excited. I am so grateful that I am a believer. Are you with me? Think about it. What God wants you to become is to prevail in every sphere. Remember the vision of prevailers. Do you understand what I'm saying? To see God's word prevail in every life and sphere of society. But do you know what makes you to prevail? The power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. That is what fuels your prevailing in life. That is what fuels your triumph in the year 2024. When you contact the power of the resurrection, you can never fail. (laughs) Even when you fall, you will see rise again. Even when you fail, you will see succeed. <laughs> oh, Kerato Sibre Nihalande. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Father, speak to us this morning. No matter how brief it is, let the words that come forth from this oracle, this vessel, let it be spirit and let it be life in the name of Jesus Christ. Let it be spirit, let it be life. In the name of Jesus, let light that brings immortality be released into our hearts this morning so that whatever may be dead, whatever may be stagnant, whatever may be undergoing recession and depression will receive a fresh dose of resurrection. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Father. It is a privilege to stand here. May your name be glorified. The Bible says no man takes upon himself this honor of becoming a high priest. But he is appointed by God to stand as a mediator. eh? 
and to administer the affairs <laughs> between God and between man. So that is why we stand and do the things that we do with the confidence that he gives us. Are you with me? Irrespective of our secular engagements. Are you with me? Whether we are traders, whether we are technicians, whether we are managers, whether we are MD CEOs, we carry the same spirit. The spirit of resurrection. We give God glory and we give God praise. Hallelujah. Jam your hands together for the Lord. As you take your seat. Hey, Karamali Anahanta. We will look very quickly on the significance of the death and the resurrection of Christ. And we will take our anchor scripture from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. A very brief scripture, and I would like us to look at it. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. But the last Adam became what? A life-giving spirit. What we see from this anchor scripture is the presentation of two races of humanity. In case you're not aware, you, you think there are many races. Are you with me? The Caucasoid race, those who carry a white skin. Hmm? The Negroid race, those who carry a dark skin. Hmm? The Oriental race, those who carry the Chinese skin. <laughs> you think that is the races we have? No, those are not races. There is only one race. It's called the human race. Right? On the general level. But that human race are divided into two spiritual races. There is a race of the first Adam. There is a race of the second Adam. The question is, which one do you belong to? Do you belong to the order of the first Adam? Or you belong to the order of the second Adam? The Bible says the first Adam, the first human race, became a living being. Right? But the second one became a life-giving spirit. And we are going to be looking at what makes one you know, different from the other. Hallelujah. And uh, by way of introduction, I will be giving you a bit of insights into what the resurrection is. Hallelujah. I trust that God will help me this morning because there's so many thoughts that need to be put together. Hallelujah. It's important we understand that without death, there wouldn't have been a resurrection. Without death, resurrection would not have been necessary. But then somebody may ask this question. Why then? Why death? Why did death come? A lot of us believe that death is, was created by Satan. But death was not a creation of Satan. I want every one of us to pay very close attention to the things that I'm going to say about death. Right? Very important. Death was not created by Satan. <laughs> it was not. As bad as death may seem, as terminal as death may appear, hmm? as much of a foreclosure as death might seem. As limiting as death may be, it was not a creation of Satan. <laughs> death was designed by God as a consequence of living outside his purpose. I repeat myself. Death was designed by God as a consequence of living outside his purpose. Death imposes a limitation on your existence if you make the choice to live at cross purposes with the will of God. Death is God's instrument to constrain the rebellious, the disobedient, and the unlawful. That was why he told Adam in Genesis chapter 2 of all the trees in the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the fruit of the tree 
of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. For in the day thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. That was how death was created. That was how death came into existence. But death was not created to hinder you. That's to be, to stop you from becoming all that God wants you to become. Rather, death came as a consequence to limit you from straying away from the path that God has designed for you. What am I trying to say? Anything in the existence that goes against God's plan and God's purpose will experience death. You can't flourish outside of God. You can't prosper outside of God. You can't succeed outside of God. Why is that so? It is so because there is what we call death. Death is waiting to constrain you, to restrain you, so that you do not go outside of God's plan and God's purpose for your life. So when you look at death from that divine perspective, it is a good thing. <laughs> is it a bad thing? It's a good thing. Because anything that does not conform and align with God's plan and God's purpose does not have God's good will to flourish. So what is that force that restrains it from flourishing and from prospering? It is the force of death. Are you with me? That was why the moment Adam decided he was going to rebel against God, what happened to him? Death came immediately. And death in this context is separation from God. Is separation from God. You have been separated from the life, from the virtues, from the blessing, from the goodwill of him who created you. Are you with me? But when death came to Adam, it came to Adam by his choice. It, he was not forced. He came to him by his choice. The question I have for all of us here as believers is what choices are you making today about the way you are living, about the things you are doing that may be moving you in the direction of being at cross purposes with God's will for your life. Because the moment a man steps out of God's will, that man has stepped into a realm of death. And so what happened in the case of Adam? Our ancestors. Adam decided to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that he was commanded not to. He chose the path of disobedience. He chose the path of rebellion. He chose a path of independence from God. And the moment a man takes on that path, what you will experience naturally is death. You will just find a limitation imposed upon your existence. Even if that limitation may not seem to be apparent, in this realm, in this world, where we live, what about the realm of eternity? What happens to you? What happens to you? You may have it good. You may have it well. In this realm. But the moment you are faced with the crossover to the other realm, what will happen to you? <laughs> will you continue to flourish? Will you continue to excel? Will you continue to prosper? It is then it will become very clear to you that the choice you made to live at cross purposes with God was the wrong choice. Hallelujah. 
And so, it is important we understand what death truly is. The question therefore is, what is the cause of death? What is the cause of death? What is the cause of death? Do you know the cause of death? Sin is the cause of death. And what is sin? Lawlessness. What is sin? Disobedience to God's word. That's what sin is all about. The moment you begin to disobey God, you know what you have done? You have committed sin. And the moment sin comes into the scene, the moment sin, S-I-N, comes into the scene, S-C-E-N-E, you have invited death into your camp. You have invited death into your situation. Hallelujah. And that is not what you and I want to see. When Joshua made a profound statement, he says, I set before you life and death. You know what you're simply saying? I give you the choice of which kind of life you want to live. Is it a life of life? Where you are brought into the realm of possibilities. Possibilities. Endless possibilities as to what you can become in God. Or do you want a life of death where you will find yourself being restrained and restricted? Now, as if to say, they may not understand what he meant when he said, I said before you life and death. He went a step further and said, I said before you, blessing and cursing. Because it takes the life of God to bless you. It takes death to do what? To curse you. To live under the blessing is to live under God's life. To live under a curse is to live in the realm of death. Because death imposes limitation. When they say a man is under a curse, we are simply saying that the man is under a spiritual limitation. There is a force that restrains him from succeeding the way he wants to succeed. He wants to succeed, but something is holding him down. That is when we say you're under a curse. And you know what curse simply means? The force of death in effect. Walking against you. That's what it is. And so when we talk about the resurrection, we are going to be looking at how we are going to get ourselves how, how God, the arrangement that God put in place to free us from the limitations of death. Most times people think death is an event. No, death is not an event. <laughs> that it is physical death that is an event. Death is a spiritual process. Death is not just a mere physical event. Death is a state of existence. Are you with me? You know what I call it? I call it negative existence. I call it life in the negative. Are you understand what I'm saying? For those of you who did mathematics, when you want to do numbering, you were taught that zero is the middle point. Anything you count from the, to, to the right is positive. Plus one, plus two, plus three, all to infinity. But when you start counting to the left, what happens? Minus one, minus two, minus three. To the infinity. Death eh, is life in the negative. Life in this context is the state of being one and being at peace with God. The state where you are living in God's perfect will, God's plan, God's purpose. That is what we call life. And that was what Jesus came to offer us in John chapter 10 verse 10. The thief cometh to steal to kill and to destroy. That is what characterizes the life of those who live under death. But I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. And what is the life he offers you? A life of liberty. A life of blessing. A life of prosperity. A life of success. A life where there is no spiritual limitation on you to succeed in the line that God wants you to. And that is why it's important we understand this in this context. So if you want to embrace death, like I was writing when the Holy Ghost was inspiring me, he says, choose to live a life of sin. You want to embrace death. You want death to affect everything that you do. Your relationship, your career, your marriage, your business, your ministry. Then choose to live a life of sin. 
by that time you will understand what Adam went through. And you know what the devil has done to, the, to men? You know what the devil did? He made sure that when it comes to the subject of sin, for some, he built a whole lot of deception around it. And so people find it difficult to live a life of sin. Let's take immorality, for example. Immorality can be all kinds. There's mental immorality. There's physical immorality. Are you with me? There's sexual immorality. There's also spiritual immorality. I hope you know there's spiritual immorality. Where you decide to worship other gods other than God. That's spiritual immorality. Sexual is when you have intercourse with persons that are not your legitimate, legitimate married partners. That's what immorality is. So what did he do? He built a pleasure system around it. So that each time you want to say you want to break free, he will remind you, you know you are deriving a lot of pleasure from this thing. Sure you know. You know you are enjoying this thing. No? You know, if you, don't, if you stop doing this thing, you will enjoy it again. And so he keeps men in captivity. Which is very, very bad. I need the fan. I'm extremely hot here. So, if you must know, death is the opposite of life. And the life I'm talking about, people of God, is not biological life. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you think he was talking about biological life? What do you think he was talking about? He was talking about the God kind of life. He's talking about what? Zoe. Somebody says Zoe. He was talking about Zoe. God's life. Hallelujah. And so, going further, death is living life away from God. Away from your life source. Right? And so the resurrection, on the other hand, is the process of restoring life back to where it was withdrawn or lost. That's what resurrection is, oh, Elosa. <laughs> resurrection is a process and I will explain to you what I mean by that. And so even though Jesus resurrected many years ago, 2000, over 2,000 years ago, you need to understand what that process really means for us. Because every time we tap into the life of God, we are tapping into the process of resurrection. And that is going to be the portion of everyone here today in the name of Jesus. The reason why we have continually succeeded in our work with God, Pastor Judah, you know why? Because the life of God is constantly on our inside, sir. Giving expression to the will of God. And so any part of our life that may be tainted or affected by the power of the consequence of sin. You know what the resurrection of what the life of God does? It injects resurrection into those areas. And so you find yourself regenerating. You are constantly being renewed. You are constantly getting infused with divine energy that propels you to succeed. Let me explain something to you, people of God. It is not normal. I repeat myself. It is not normal for a believer to remain at the same spot for too long. It is not normal to experience retrogression when others are experiencing progression. When you notice that your life is going back the life of God is being withdrawn from you. There is something you are doing. We call it sin. You have brought sin into the camp. And God cannot coexist with sin. No, he can't. The moment God sees sin, guess what? Sin is not a problem for God. Are you with me? Because he has made adequate provision by the blood of Jesus. To cleanse you from your sin. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 verse 7. In him we have what? Redemption. Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Repeated verbatim. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. In him we have redemption. Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Echoed in a different way. By First John chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When sin comes into your life 
and you recognize that you have sinned and you decide I will not remain in this sin, the blood will speak for you. The blood will cleanse you. The blood will wash you away. But when you make a choice to dwell in the sin like a pig dwells in the field of mud, you know what happens? What you have done is to give God reason to withdraw from you. That is why the Bible tells us not to quench the spirit of God. That's why the, that's why the, the, the word God says, don't grieve the Holy Ghost. Don't quench the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is like a fire burning on your inside. It's time you intentionally go and carry sin into your lap. You know what you are doing? You are carrying water and pouring on the fire to quench it. It is your choice. And God will not strive or contend with any man. When it comes to the subject of how you want to live your life, he will not force himself on you. No. That is why he is called the gentle Holy Spirit. Are you with me? But what you are simply doing is inviting death into your life. Inviting limitation. Inviting restriction. Imposing the will of Lucifer upon your life and upon your situation. Can you see how it is so clear? How some people find themselves in situations that they begin to ask themselves, how did I get here in the first place? You went and touched sin. And you held on to sin because of one pleasure it is giving you that doesn't make any sense. You are under the bondage and the deception of hell. And a son of God ought not to be under deception. A child of God ought not to be under bondage. You know why? Because there is resurrection power at work on your inside. What did he tell us? And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You know who the Holy Ghost is? The Holy Ghost is a force of resurrection. When he enters on your inside, what does he do? He came and he empowers you to break from the shackles and the captivity that Satan has imposed upon your life through the death situation you were living in before now. So the moment you step into life, the life of God, you are not expected to live a life of captivity anymore. Jesus was speaking in John chapter 8 verse 32. He says, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Most times we think the truth is just the foundational doctrines of Jesus. When Jesus made that statement, there were two dimensions by which we can look at that statement. And ye shall know the truth. He told us in John 14 verse 6, I am the truth. So when you know the truth, the one who is the embodiment of resurrection life, that truth will do what? Will set you free. And whoever, to make it now clear that he was referring to himself, he says, and whoever the Son of God sets free is what? Is free indeed. Your liberty is at the instance of your contact with the resurrection power of God that is in Christ Jesus. Are you with me? The first Adam became a living being, but the second Adam became a life-giving spirit. Giving life to anyone who chooses to receive him into their heart so that they can be free of any form of captivity. Free of any form of bondage. Free of any form of affliction. Free of any form of oppression. As a Christian, you are not expected to live under any form of bondage. No! Because you carry resurrection life. The force of divinity. The force of life on your inside. That life does not know limitation. No! It does not know. Blessed be God. The Bible tells us, well, these are insights. He says, Oh, Kimani, the resurrection is a process of restoring life back to where it was withdrawn or where it was lost. The resurrection is a consequence or the result of Christ's obedience to the will of God. If death came as a result of Adam's disobedience, then, then life will come as a result 
of Christ obedience. We see that clearly enumerated, expansiated, elucidated by Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5. Are you with me? If you read the entire scripture, Romans chapter 5, you will see it very clearly captured there. It was because of his obedience that life came. And the process by which the life came is what we call resurrection. Katakabaya. It's what we call what? Resurrection. The resurrection. Now, what Adam suffered was death and degeneration due to his disobedience. Check it. You, I have not seen a man living in obedience that is degenerating in his life. I have never seen it. That you are living in obedience to God's word and your marriage is degenerating. You are living in obedience to God's word and your career is degenerating. You are living in obedience to God's word and your business is failing. I have not seen a man. But go and check your life. You that is suffering one issue or the other. One setback or the other. I mean, when I'm talking about setback, I'm talking about continuous setback. You observe continuous setback. Ah, something is not right. There is a sin somewhere. You have invited death through your what? Your life of sin. Can somebody give me that scripture that says, okay, can you give me that scripture that says, um, okay, don't worry, let me do it myself. Hallelujah. Oh, Melande Setelieti, Kaliada Kanahazaniya Maha. Roboshe, Irate, Karuba. Go to the media. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. You see that? Check somewhere there. You will see where he says. The sting of death <laughs> is sin. <laughs> and the power of sin is in the law. So where does death derive its power? Death derives its power from where? From sin. <laughs> you commit sin. You are empowering death to reign in your life. You live a life of sin. You are giving power to the force of death to rule and to prevail over your life. That is what sin does. People think sin is just an act that does not have consequence. You are making a big mistake. Anytime you intentionally, deliberately, willfully go and sin against God. You know what you are doing? You are inviting death into your situation. You are bringing death into your camp. Remember the story of Achan. When they went to fight that war against I. I was a small nation. They had defeated bigger nations than I before. Suddenly they went into battle against a small fly country called I. And they found themselves being defeated. And they were like, ah. Joshua said, what is it? This small, this small country, ah. he could not explain it. He went and laid down on his face before God and said, God, you need to explain to me. I don't understand it. We have defeated bigger nations than I. How come we are falling in the face of our enemies? And he remembered what God told them in Deuteronomy. He says, when your enemies shall come against you one way, seven ways they shall flee. Now they found themselves fleeing when they came against their enemy. They were the ones fleeing in seven ways. Ah, Keba Itamo. Look at the blessings and the cursing that came as a result of the covenant in Deuteronomy chapter 28. If thou shalt do what? Hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to obey all his commandments. All these blessings shall come upon thee. And they shall do what? They shall overtake thee. And then he started telling us, And thou shalt be the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only and not beneath. Are you with me? You will be blessed in your going out. You will be blessed in your coming in. You will be blessed in your storehouse. You will be blessed in the field. Everything was blessing. But he now told them, he said, But if you choose to live a disobedient life, all these curses shall come upon thee and they shall overtake thee then you will be the tail and not the head. You will be below and not beneath. I mean, you will be beneath and not above. Are you with me? When the enemy, your enemy shall call, you will go against your enemy, seven ways you will flee and you will be defeated from among them. You know what he was trying to tell them? This is the consequence of living a life of disobedience. Put it in the New Testament context. This is the consequence of living a life of sin. Sin is not just an act, sir. 
sin is a state. <laughs> and if you live in that state, what are you doing? You are giving power to death, to restrain you, to limit you, to constrain you, to put you in a mode that you ought not to be. Because God didn't call you to live a life of restraint. No. When he blessed us, he blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Only I looked at that scripture so many times recently. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. And God blessed us with all. Somebody say all. Somebody say all. That statement is mind-blowing. There is nothing left that God did not give you in Christ Jesus. He says, what? God has blessed us with all, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There is nothing he left outside of Christ. That is why he said in, first, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You know what makes you new? Resurrection power is what makes you new. Resurrection power is, is the power of renewal. The power of regeneration. The power of redemption. The power of reconciliation. The power of restoration. That is what, that is what the restoration power does when it enters into your life as a child of God. So it's important you carry yourself with the mentality that you are, a, you are an embodiment. You are a vessel. You are a container that gives expression to what? To the life of God on your inside. And we call that life resurrection life. That is why when you say a thing, he says, and thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto you. You know why it shall be established? Because of resurrection power. Because of resurrection power. That is why you don't joke with your words. <laughs> Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know why? Because I am the resurrection and the life. And you saw what we said in 2 um, John chapter 3, from uh, 2 John chapter 3 verse 2, and 2 John chapter 4 verse 17. If I can remember in last Saturday's prayer meeting, where I told you, the scripture says, as he is, so are we in this world. Not so we will be in this world. No. As he is lifted, exalted, glorified in power, in honor, in blessing, in wisdom, in dignity. That is how you are presently in this world. But the question is, do you believe it? Do you agree with it? If you do, you will open your mouth and decree that you are what the word says you are. Are you with me? You will shut your mouth and be quiet. When Satan comes with his temptation, you will open your mouth like Jesus did. It is written. It is what? Written. I shall be the head and not the tail. The devil comes telling you to come and sin. You will tell him, it is written. Sin shall not have the dominion over me because I am not under the law of sin and death anymore. I am under the law of grace and truth. Are you with me? That is what resurrection power does. It gives power and life to the things you say. Are you with me? Know what you carry. When situation comes your way, don't be looking for pastor. Don't be looking for pastor. Open your mouth and decree it. In. The Bible says, and thou shalt decree 18 and it shall be established unto you. Listen to what he told us. He says, God who confirmed the words of his servant and performed the counsel of his messengers. Let me shock you. It is the words of servants that he confirms and it is the words of his messengers that he what? He performs. Are you with me? Are you a servant in a new dispensation? Hello sir. Are you a servant? If God can confirm the words of his servant and perform the counsel of his messenger, what will he do to the words of his son? Hey! Hey! What will he do to the words of his son? The Bible tells me in 1 John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, for as many as received him, to them he gave the word, the power to become the children of God. The King James says the power to become the sons of God, even for as many as believed in his name. 
Are you with me? That is what it means to be a son. Situation comes your way. You do what? You call it by the name you want to call it. Jesus was telling them, Thou shalt say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea. Sons live by faith. They don't live by fear. Sons live by faith. They don't live by assumption. Sons live by faith. They don't live by the economic situation. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you a carrier of resurrection life? A carriasso ilande in kalunda akamate eretosa kalahata. Oh, you want to see a man that carries resurrection life? Is a man that is always neko sita leka beto rame tese kata pate imprata lekota kedase. Any time you are giving a platform to give expression to resurrection life, that is what you would like to do. Hey, <laughs> Ramahante Yakanae. You want to see those who are. Are all examples of what? Of resurrection instances. Where the power of God, right, came into the scene to bring about these miracles. And it's important as children of God that we look at our lives and look at our situation and begin to ask ourselves, what is it about my life that needs to be what? <laughs> that needs to be what? <clears throat> that needs to change. That needs to what? That needs to change. It's a moment that you need to contemplate for yourself. You do not sit back and see your life run idly by. I was telling you the other day, I said, it is the words that you speak concerning your situation that changes your situation. And it is those words that you received from him that makes the difference. Be a man of the word. Be a man of the spirit. I was sharing with some people recently. I said, when the word of God comes to you, three things happen to you. How do you know that you have contacted resurrection life? Right? The words that will come will give you hope. The words that will come will give you faith. The words that you come, that will come, will stir up your love for God. Anytime you have an encounter with the resurrection power of God, these three things must happen, sir. Are you with me? Your hope is stirred up. Your faith is built. The love of God is imparted on your spirit. I said anytime you have an encounter with the word of God, two things must happen. You must be imparted by grace and truth. And when you, how do you know you have, been, you have received grace? You feel empowered. You do what? You feel what? Empowered. And anytime you see a people empowered by God, what happens to them? 
Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Anytime a people are empowered by God, what happens to them? I close with that scripture. What happens to them? Echo, <laughs> kamehene. And when they had prayed, all of you read the scripture, one, two, go. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happens? How do we know that they were filled with the Holy Ghost? Echo, kame, ah! And they speak the word of God. With what? With boldness. They speak the word of God. With boldness. It is this bold speaking that changes your situation. When they looked at Jesus, they made a statement. They said this one does not speak like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They said he spake as one with what? Authority. When you carry resurrection power, people of God, you confront your situation with boldness and the authority that that, that, that life confers on you. That was why Jesus said in John 6, 63, the flesh profits nothing, but the spirit gives life. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What makes them spirit, what makes them life, is the resurrection power of God. And today, as we commemorate the death and the resurrection of Jesus, God wants to give you a fresh dose of his resurrection power. God wants to release life afresh into your spirit, into your situation, into your life, into your circumstances. That is what God wants to do. Are you with me? God will not come from heaven and touch you, but God will speak words into your heart that will change you. Rise up on your feet with me. Erekazi malando rohodo epelite pamata hakamataya I want you to open your mouth and begin to stir the waters of the power of resurrection on your inside. You know what? The power of resurrection is on your inside. It is where? It is on your inside. It is a fountain we call the Holy Spirit. If you carry the Holy Ghost, oh, that power is there. And the way you stay it is by praying. Leke, Korete, Petene, Pataka, Panto, Panabale, Preteka, Prenote, Imprenta, 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 Leke, Karahata, Rake, Karabala, Mahata, Mahara, Palaka, Karabahata, Palaka, Karabahala, Pampre de Honde, Pampre de Honde. Pampre de Honde, 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 Pampre de Honde,